Welcome back to our series as we talk about the Book of Enoch. If you're new to this series, please start at the beginning and work your way through. I've already presented most of my argument, so I really suggest you start at the beginning. I want to pick up where we left off in the last video. So in the last video, we were going through chapter 48 of Enoch, and we were showing how Enoch said that Jesus is essentially the firstborn of all creation, which is what Paul also said, that Jesus was there before the world was created, which John said, Paul said, Jesus said, and it's in other places throughout the New Testament. Enoch said it first, and we are looking at how he says that in chapter 48. But there are a few other things in that same passage that I want to point out. For example, he said, He will be a staff to the righteous on which to stay themselves and not fall, and he will be the light of the Gentiles and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. So Enoch is describing this coming Messiah as a light to the Gentiles. This is a phrase that we see in Isaiah chapter 9, but it's also something that we see in Matthew 4. He is a light to the Gentiles. This is a description of Jesus that we can see starting in Enoch, used in the Old Testament, yes, but also used in the New Testament. Something that we can see this connection that this book has with everything else. He also says, all who dwell on earth will fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. This is something very similar to what Paul says in Philippians 2, where he says, Every knee will bow to the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and bring glory to the Father. So Enoch said, all who dwell on earth will fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. So they're falling down before Jesus and they're worshiping him and they're praising God. Paul describes every knee will bow to the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and bring glory to God the Father. So it's the exact same description in Enoch as well as in Philippians 2. I'm going to come back to this verse in Philippians 2 later on in the book of Enoch because there's another parallel that comes back to this, but we're going to look at that later. Later on in this chapter in 1st Enoch, he describes the judgment of the sinners, and I'm not going to read this whole section, but he sums up why they are getting judged in this sentence. He says, for they have denied the Lord of spirits and his anointed. So these people are being judged. Why? Because they've denied God and God's anointed. That word anointed in Greek is the word Christ. They've denied Christ. This is what the book of Enoch has to say about Christ. And this came, again, long before the church age. Enoch continues then describing Jesus, describing this anointed. He says, for wisdom is poured out like water, and glory fails not before him forevermore. For he is mighty in all the secrets of righteousness, and unrighteousness will disappear as a shadow and have no continuance. Because the elect one stands before the Lord of spirits, and his glory is forever and ever, and his might unto all generations, and in him dwells the spirit of wisdom and the spirit which gives insight and the spirit of understanding and of might and the spirit of those who have fallen asleep in righteousness. And he will judge the secret things and none will be able to utter a lying word before him for he is the elect one before the Lord of spirits according to his good pleasure. I just think that these descriptions in the book of Enoch are just so incredible to read and recognizing that this was all written before Jesus, before the church age, seeing these ancient descriptions of what to expect the Messiah to be, you understand where they were getting these things from. 
Now, I'm not going to keep drawing parallels because I, I'm assuming the majority of my readers know the New Testament well enough to make some of these connections themselves and see like, wow, that really is describing who the New Testament says Jesus is. Like these things about Jesus that the New Testament says that you can't really find very clearly stated in the Old Testament. The book of Enoch says those things explicitly and it was written before the New Testament. It was written before the apostles and Jesus ever came. So if this was written first and it says the exact same thing, then clearly they were drawing from this and teaching this. And this book is at the very least accurate, even if they weren't referencing it. It is at the very least accurate because it says the same thing the New Testament says. And if we accept that the New Testament is teaching us truth about Jesus, then we need to recognize that the book of Enoch says the same thing and it came first. So it's at least accurate and worth reading. So let's just keep reading what the book of Enoch has to say about Jesus. And again, I'm not going to draw parallels to the New Testament for everything. I'm going to assume you know enough about Jesus to draw these connections yourself. So let's keep reading a few of these examples. And in those days will the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it. And Sheol also will give back that which it has received. And hell will give back that which it owes. For in those days the elect one will arise, and he will choose the righteous and holy from among them. For the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved. And the elect one will in those days sit on my throne, and his mouth will pour out all the secrets of wisdom and counsel. For the Lord of spirits has given them to him and has glorified him. In Enoch chapter 52, Enoch says he sees these mountains of iron and copper and silver and gold and, and metal and lead. He says, and these mountains which your eyes have seen, the mountain of iron and the mountain of copper and the mountain of silver and the mountain of gold and the mountain of soft metal and the mountain of lead, all these will be in the presence of the elect one as wax before the fire and like the water which streams down from above upon those mountains and they will become powerless before his feet. And it will come to pass in those days that none will be saved either by gold or by silver and none be able to escape. And there will be no iron for war, nor will one clothe oneself with a breastplate. Bronze will be of no service and tin will be of no service and will not be esteemed and lead will not be desired. And all these things will be denied and destroyed from the surface of the earth when the elect one will appear before the face of the Lord of Spirits. In chapter 53, Enoch says, And after this, the righteous and elect one will cause the house of his congregation to appear. From now on, they will no more be hindered in the name of the Lord of Spirits. And these mountains will not stand as the earth before his righteousness, but the hills will be as a fountain of water, and the righteous will have rest from the oppression of sinners. And once again, I want to point out that the word church in the New Testament comes from a Greek word which means congregation. He says, the righteous and elect one will cause the house of his congregation to appear. And from now on, they will no more be hindered in the name of the Lord of Spirits. In Enoch 55 verse 4, he says, you mighty kings who dwell on the earth, you will have to behold mine elect one, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel and all his associates and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of Spirits. Now again, from earlier in the series, Azazel was one of those angels that fell and it says that all sin is attributed to him. It seems to implicate that he is the cause of those angels falling because it says that he taught women how to beautify themselves, how to wear makeup and make themselves very appealing, which is what ultimately led to those other angels saying, wow, women are beautiful. We want to take them as wives. So God said earlier in the book of Enoch to Azazel, we will ascribe all sin. So then here in chapter 55, we see it's saying the elect one will sit on the throne of glory and judge Azazel and all his associates and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of Spirits. In chapter 61, verse 8 to 11, And the Lord of Spirits placed the elect one on the throne of glory, and he will judge all the works of the holy above in the heaven 
and in the balance will their deeds be weighed, and when he will lift up his countenance to judge their secret ways according to the word of the name of the Lord of Spirits, and their path according to the way of the righteous judgment of the Lord of Spirits, then will they all with one voice speak and bless and glorify and extol and sanctify the name of the Lord of Spirits. And he will summon all the host of the heavens and all the holy ones above and the host of God, the cherubim, seraphim, and ophanim, and all the angels of power and all the angels of principalities and the elect one and the other powers on the earth and over the water on that day will raise one voice and bless and glorify and exalt in the spirit of faith and in the spirit of wisdom and in the spirit of patience and in the spirit of mercy and in the spirit of judgment and of peace and in the spirit of goodness and will all say with one voice blessed is he and may the name of the Lord of Spirits be blessed forever and ever. In chapter 62, it says, And so the Lord commanded the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who dwell on the earth and said, Open your eyes and lift up your horns if you are able to recognize the elect one. And the Lord of Spirits seated him on the throne of his glory, and the spirit of righteousness was poured out upon him, and the word of his mouth slays all the sinners, and all the unrighteous are destroyed from before his face. And there will stand up in that day all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who hold the earth, and they will see and recognize how he sits on the throne of his glory, and righteousness is judged before him, and no lying word is spoken before him. Then will pain come upon them, as on a woman in travail when her child enters the mouth of the womb, and she has pain in bringing out. And one portion of them will look on the other and they will be terrified and they will be downcast of countenance and pain will seize them when they see that son of man sitting on the throne of his glory. And the kings and the mighty and all who possess the earth will bless and glorify and extol him who rules over all who was hidden. For from the beginning... The Son of Man was hidden, and the Most High preserved him in the presence of his might and revealed him to the elect. And the congregation of the elect and holy will be sown, and all the elect will stand before him on that day, and all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth will fall down before him on their faces and worship and set their hope upon that Son of Man and petition him and supplicate for mercy at his hands. Nevertheless, that Lord of Spirits will so press them that they will have to go out from his presence and their faces will be filled with shame and the darkness grow deeper on their faces. And he will deliver them to the angels for punishment to execute vengeance on them because they have oppressed his children and his elect. And they will be a spectacle for the righteous and for his elect. They will rejoice over them because the wrath of the Lord of Spirits rests upon them, and his sword is drunk with their blood. And the righteous and elect will be saved on that day, and they will never again see the face of the sinners and unrighteous. And the Lord of Spirits will abide over them, and with that Son of Man they will eat and lie down and rise up forever and ever. And the righteous and elect will have risen from the earth and ceased to be of downcast countenance. And they will have been clothed with garments of glory, and these will be the garments of life from the Lord of Spirits. And your garments will not grow old, nor your glory pass away before the Lord of Spirits. That right there is pretty much one full chapter just summarizing what the whole New Testament teaches about Jesus and his coming. And like I said earlier, in Philippians 2, Paul said, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and will give glory to the Father. That is what Enoch is describing. Everyone is going to see him and understand who he is and they will bow before him and worship him and recognize that he is Lord and God is God. And the wicked will beg for mercy, but they're going to be sent away. But the righteous, they'll have life in him. 
This is what the book of Enoch teaches about Jesus. Is this not what the New Testament also teaches about Jesus? And yet the book of Enoch was written first. So why do we not read this? Let's keep going. Again, in Enoch 69, starting in verse 26. And there was great joy among them, and they blessed and glorified and extolled, because the name of that Son of Man had been revealed unto them. And he sat on the throne of his glory, and the sum of judgment was given unto the Son of Man, and he caused the sinners to pass away and be destroyed from off the face of the earth, and those who have led the world astray. With chains they will be bound, and in their assemblage place of destruction will they be imprisoned, and all their works vanish from the face of the earth. And from now on there will be nothing corruptible, for that Son of Man has appeared and has seated himself on the throne of his glory, and all evil will pass away before his face, and the word of that Son of Man will go out and be strong before the Lord of Spirits." Again, such an incredible description here of what the New Testament teaches, and yet it was in the book of Enoch beforehand. We see in this passage Enoch talking about the Son of Man sitting on the throne of his glory. That's a phrase that Jesus himself used when talking about when he comes. Jesus said, the Son of Man will come again in his great glory with all his angels. He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations of the world will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This is the same description Enoch is giving. The Son of Man will come in his glory. He will sit on his glorious throne, and he will separate the righteous from the sinners. Enoch also describes that the righteous, those who are saved, they're blessing and they're praising because the name of the Son of Man was revealed to them. Enoch also said, from now on there will be nothing corruptible, for that Son of Man has appeared and has seated himself on the throne of his glory and all evil will pass away before his face. That word corruptible referred to how things die and decay. And he's saying from now on, Nothing will die and decay. Why does nothing die and decay? Because Jesus defeated death itself. These are things that were taught by the book of Enoch. Jesus defeated death. That is an essential part of why he came. Again, that atheist friend of mine that I mentioned in an earlier video, one of the things he said was, to him, he reads the New Testament and it seems like they're expecting a physical king to come and rule a physical kingdom and then jesus didn't really do that so he's like well it seems like they kind of then changed their minds and made it a spiritual victory instead of a physical one and and changed what they were expecting kind of like they they rewrote the prophecies in their mind to say well the messiah was going to come and do these spiritual things but he says like that doesn't seem like that's what they were expecting or what the old testament said it seems like they were expecting this physical victory and when they didn't get that then they made up this idea of a spiritual victory but here we have the book of enoch telling us that when the messiah comes nothing will be corruptible nothing will decay anymore nothing will die anymore because the son of man is on his throne and there is no more evil there is definitely a spiritual victory that the book of enoch is telling us ahead of time and the book of Enoch does get into more detail, which we will see in just a bit. But let's keep going. In chapter 71, Enoch says, And that head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Raphael and Phanuel, thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he came to me and greeted me with his voice and said unto me, This is the Son of Man who is born unto righteousness, and righteousness abides over him, and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. And he said unto me, He proclaims unto you peace in the name of the world to come, for from hence has proceeded peace since the creation of the world, and so will it be unto you forever and forever and ever. And all will walk in his ways, since righteousness never forsakes him. With him will be their dwelling places, and with him their heritage, and they will not be separated from him forever and ever and ever. 
And so there will be length of days with that Son of Man, and the righteous will have peace and upright way in the name of the Lord of Spirits forever and ever. And finally, I want to look at chapter 92, starting in verse 2. Let not your spirit be troubled on account of the times. For the Holy and Great One has appointed days for all things. And the Righteous One will arise from sleep, will arise and walk in the paths of righteousness, and all his path and conversation will be in eternal goodness and grace. He will be gracious to the righteous and give him eternal uprightness, and he will give him power so that he will be endowed with goodness and righteousness, and he will walk in eternal light. And sin will perish in darkness forever and will no more be seen from that day forevermore. This passage to me is so incredible because Enoch throughout the whole book has been referring to this coming Messiah as the elect one, the anointed one, the son of man, and he calls him the righteous one. And here it says, the righteous one will arise from sleep. He will arise and walk in the paths of righteousness. What does it mean to arise from sleep? Well, throughout the New Testament, death is referred to as sleep. To those who believed in the resurrection, they understood that death was just a type of sleep that we would one day wake up from. And here Enoch is saying, the righteous one will arise from sleep. He will arise and walk in the paths of righteousness. This is really interesting to me because when we read the New Testament, we read passages like this one. In John 20, verse 8 and 9, it says, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed, for they did not yet understand from the scriptures that it was necessary for him to rise from the dead. Now, this is just one example of many places throughout the New Testament where it says the scriptures told them that it was necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead. The scriptures told them. And yet, when we read the Old Testament, we don't really have any clear place where the scriptures say the anointed one is going to rise from the dead. We see the apostles reference a place where David said, your Holy One will not see corruption. Your Holy One will not decay. Okay? He's saying, your Holy One will not die and decay. And the apostles talk about how, well, David did die and decay, so he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about the Messiah who was to come would not see corruption. He would not decay. But that's pretty much the only place in our standard Old Testament where we can get this idea that it was necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead. But, if we include the book of Enoch, it says, point blank, the righteous one will arise from sleep. And death was referred to as sleep. So the book of Enoch not only tells us about this elect one, about this chosen one, this anointed one, and how he'll sit on a throne of glory, how he's going to judge the righteous and the sinners, not only does it tell us that he was there before the world was made, but it also tells us that he, it is necessary for him to rise from the dead. And again, in the book of John, it says they did not yet understand from the scriptures that it was necessary for him to rise from the dead. The book of Enoch tells us it's necessary for him to rise from the dead. And the book of John tells us that the scriptures tell us it's necessary for him to rise from the dead. And our Old Testaments don't really say that very clearly other than that one verse. Given how much the apostles and Jesus were referencing the book of Enoch, given how much the book of Enoch teaches the truth about Jesus, I would say it is very likely that when they said the scriptures say it's necessary for him to rise from the dead, they were referring to the book of Enoch. Because the book of Enoch says, point blank, the righteous one will arise from sleep. And they understood that death is just a form of sleep. So, 
These are all examples of things that the book of Enoch says about Jesus. And what I want you to take away from this is how much the book of Enoch teaches exactly what the New Testament teaches. And yet the book of Enoch came first. I know I say that a lot in this series, but that is so important for you to remember when you look at these things. The book of Enoch came first and it says what the New Testament says. It teaches the exact same things about Jesus, about his lordship, about the fact that he was there before the creation of the world, about the fact that he is a son of man who will sit on a throne of glory and judge the world. Every knee will bow before him. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord and will praise God. And it was necessary that he rise from the dead. The book of Enoch said all of these things before the New Testament was ever written. So if we want to really understand the New Testament, we need to understand that they were teaching from a book that we don't include in our Bibles. And we need to understand the history of why we don't include it in our Bibles and then reevaluate whether or not we should include it in our Bibles. And I would say the evidence is overwhelmingly pointing to the fact that the book of Enoch should be considered scripture. And I hope you can see why I would come to that conclusion after reading it and comparing it to what the apostles were saying and teaching. And as I've already pointed out in the series, I want to point out again, the Christian scholars who write all the Christian books that Christians read all the theology books, all of the things that Christians are reading and learning from these people, those scholars all recognize that the New Testament was influenced by the book of Enoch and that the apostles and Jesus were teaching from the book of Enoch. They all agree. There's a consensus. They don't question it. But they don't tell you about that. So this is something you should go look into for yourself and see what you think about it. And you should read it and understand that historically, this book was considered to be scripture at the time of Jesus by many Jewish people. Not all of them, the Sadducees, for example, didn't. But there was no consensus at that time of what was scripture and what was not. So understanding that there was no consensus, well, then let's look at what Jesus and the apostles considered to be scripture and what they did not. And it's clear they considered the book of Enoch to be scripture and they are reliable sources. So if we're going to base our canon of scripture on anybody's view at that time, we should base it on the view of Jesus and the apostles, because at that time, they are the most reliable people we could possibly base our view on. There was no consensus of what was scripture, so we can't go off of what the Jewish people considered to be scripture because there was no consensus until later. And that consensus was formed by people who hate Jesus. So we have to look before that. And before that, we can see there was no consensus, in which case we should look at the people we consider to be reliable, who had the spirit of God in them and see what they thought and they thought the book of Enoch was scripture. And they quoted it. They taught from it. They understood Jesus' nature from it. And so we should too. So I'm done going through the book of Enoch for now. I really encourage you to go read it. In my next video, I want to talk about the implications on what this means, how we should be processing this. And I want to talk about just briefly some of the other books that we consider to be not scripture. And I'm not going to go into detail with those. I'm using the book of Enoch as an example, but I want to encourage you to look into others. But I'll talk about that in the next video. What do we think about those and where do we go from here? So thank you for joining me. I hope that you have found all of this as fascinating as I do. And I hope that as you hear these words written by Enoch, you see how incredible it is and how beautiful it is. All of these things that he wrote about Jesus long before Jesus came. Because 
I think that this is one of the most incredible books ever written. And I really want to encourage all of you to go out and read it and study it and have your whole worldview shaped by it. Because Jesus and the apostles had their worldview shaped by it. And we want to be like them. So thanks for joining me. Please continue with me into the next video. Please join me in that video. And thanks for watching.